welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, really pleased to be joined today by Andy Farquharson, who is the president of Winning by Design in Europe. And uh, Andy's had a long uh, career in sales. He's also been a, a semi-professional rugby player for 10 years, nomading around the world, uh, following his passion. Um, so now with uh, Winning by Design, which uh, was recently voted the best sales consultancy in the US or in the world by our G2 crowd. So uh, really looking forward to uh, learning some secrets of, of B2B sales and what's going on here. So Andy, welcome to the show. Stephen, thank you very much for having us. It's absolutely a pleasure to come and really have a conversation and share our passion, uh, which is really around sort of sales and, and helping people to sort of start to be able to work smarter instead of harder. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Yeah, great. So Andy, I, you guys have got a, a scientific approach to sales and I, I want to dig into that and uh, I, I really like the, the methodology. But, but let's, let's maybe start with some of the, the first principles. Like what are some of the changes that have happened in B2B sales that, that we should be uh, wary of as we're, you know, we're designing our, our sales structure and sales process? Yeah, awesome. And, and always a great place to start. Uh, we think that there's, there's been a, like a huge amount of change uh, when it comes to B2B sales. And look, the, the biggest one that we find has been with, uh, has really been around the, the explosion of software as a service. So okay. that, that ability to be able to deliver software at a much cheaper, at a, at a much sort of more efficient way means that we actually go and it's changing the values of what we sell and it's changing more importantly how our customers want to buy. So, Stephen, have you ever seen the movie Hidden Figures? Uh, which movie? Invictus? It's called Hidden Figures. Hidden Victors. Sorry, no, I, I haven't. I haven't. What is it? Okay, it's this fantastic film about, uh, about these uh, African-American women, about how they sort of get brought into to NASA as part of the Apollo missions and they get brought in to do these sort of amazing calculations. But right. during this film, like one of the things that NASA also does is that they go buy this huge IBM machine to help them do all these calculations. Mm. But the first thing they had to do prior to actually getting the value out of this machine, they had to actually uh, they had to knock down the side of the building wow. to be able to put this machine in. So okay. like, it's fairly sort of significant. And so, but uh, basically they had all this, uh, and all this risk was being put on NASA to be able to do this. Now, just one quick question for you. What do you think the person, uh, the, the IBM salesperson was doing when NASA had to knock down the walls and, and teach themselves how to utilize this new machine they built? Well, I guess they, were, they would have been there. They would have been there every step of the way and, uh, you know, pushing Even it. You're so generous. <laughs> <laughs> they were off in the Bahamas already. <laughs> I, I, that's where I, I, I think they drove to the airport in their brand new convertible Mercedes. She then yep. sat in first class gone. drinking her champagne on their way to, on their way to Carbo. Like, okay. the, the reality is, like, back in the day, when, like, when was, people were selling these sort of large, perpetual, or sort of once-off, all the risk was on the customer. Was on the customer. We had to like we. It was we as the customers. We bore all the risks. But in the world of SaaS, it, it's trying to change drastically. Like okay, we're flipping it to the other side. I mean, because the reality is, we sort of go and invest all this money to go and win this customer. But then after a month, they can just leave. So yeah, exactly. we can't, it, it's changes the yeah, way. Whereas we might have had situations sell. where, where sales reps did a big deal and they left <laughs> and they left the, the customer <laughs> in the company with a problem to fix, right? They've made a lot of promises. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, the, the power's really shifted. The shoe's on the other foot here. Yeah, absolutely. And it sort of, it also changes what people are looking to buy. I mean, if, if you look about, if, if you look about uh, like that, that example with NASA and IBM, mm. they were buying it on perceived future value. Okay? Sure. This is what it's going to, like, we're going to have to do a lot of work. We're going to have to train our teams. We're going to have to train the machine. But in the future, this is the value it's going to provide. Yes. When in reality, like in today's world, people want things immediately. 
I mean, we're, we're all doing that. Eh? If you, mm. uh, look, we, we go for something on Amazon or the Iconic or anywhere, we're expecting it to rock up the next day. Um, and that's very much the same in the B2B sense. So people aren't buying on value. They're looking to be able to buy on impact. Okay? okay. How is it that people deliver that impact immediately? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, so what, does that, what does that mean for sales teams and, and for, for companies selling these solutions, right? So we've gone from you're selling a million dollar license or a $5 million computer. People hardly buy computers. They're buying capacity now, aren't they, on a, a monthly fee? And uh, they're buying apps that just do a, a small part of the job. Maybe they're not buying a massive app that needs uh, you know, lots of development. Again, when you had to do all that customization and development, the risk was on the customer, right? So um, yeah. you, 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 what has it meant for sales organizations? Well, there's, I mean, there's a couple of things that have really changed for them. I mean, the first thing yeah. that we're seeing is there's been a drastic shortening of the sales cycle. Mm. Okay? And so this has obviously come from the reduction of the value as well. So the reduction of the value mean, meant that, uh, look, people, we need to be selling more right, at a higher volume and at a higher velocity, but also our sales cycles are shrinking. Right? What, 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 so what people were, I mean, customers really enjoyed the, having a, a salesperson come and wind the diamond, take them out for a round of golf, go out for a nice expensive steak dinner. Mm. And the salesperson loved it too. They always sit there, they got to jump on the plane, build up those frequent flyer miles, take their, to take their family on a free holiday. But the reality is now, because people are buying on impact, they want, they want it to happen quickly as well. Mm. Okay, so they actually need, they, they, don't, they're, 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 they don't need the in-person business. They're happy to do things online via Skype or via Zoom uh, or, and they, they're happy to connect via multiple different boards of messaging uh, purely so they can go and, and engage and, and, and get to that impact quicker. So mm. that's, one of the, that's one of the first big changes. Yeah. I alluded to the second one in, in that there's a whole change, there's a whole sort of increase in the velocity uh, and the volume of deals that needs to happen uh, because of this SaaS environment. So, well, and, and when I say SaaS, it's also just the, the raise of subscription. Like a, a lot mm. of companies are looking to lower that upfront cost and do that with subscription. So there's a whole bunch more volume. And that leads us to another huge challenge. Uh, and that sort of, that's really around the fact that we can't rely on superstars anymore. I mean, in, in, back in the world, back in the world where we were selling these huge deals, like these huge multi-million dollar deals, we could rely on our twenty on the twenty percent of superstars that we had in our business to deliver eighty percent of that revenue. You know, yes. Because the, the wins that they had were so great that they'd be able to cover everyone else who wasn't quite hitting targets uh, in, in that particular month. Mm. But in today, with the much smaller ACVs, if we're sort of relying on that 20, 80, like so twenty percent of the people delivering eighty percent of the revenue, and they have they have a, a slightly sort of off month or off quarter, mm. then that whole out of whack so we've got to we've got to start thinking about how we can transform to actually start bringing uh bringing our bringing our sales teams to have 80 percent of our sales teams delivering 80 percent of the revenue mm. so that it, it's a big change and i'd say there's a lot of organizations still with the 80 20 right or you, you see a lot of companies oh. yeah they are still trying to find these superstar salespeople. They're paying a lot of money um, to cover that cost. They're actually overlaying the targets pretty substantially. You know, 150, 170, 200% overlay. Most of them aren't making target. You've only got 10, 20%, you know, maybe making the target and they're making the whole company target <laughs> that way. Oh, but, and but they're, also, burning, but they're burning um, uh, VC money. Right, doing that just to ramp, but but it's it, but it's probably not. I don't know. It, it's uh, not a sustainable. It's not. You know, when you actually have to start making a profit, it's going to work, is it? Well, no. I mean, it, and it, it, it's actually stopping people from growing to be able to grow their business. I mean, the and it's it's good, and it's something you, we see all the time, right? Where, where people are okay. they're they're taking very they're taking a very people centric approach. To be able to grow, because I mean, you, you talked about the fact that they're, they're they're starting to to increase sort of the, the coverage that they've got on their quotas, and they're just burning a whole bunch of cash 
uh, because they've sort of got to hire these people. But then there's also the huge organisational distractions that come with that. I mean, someone's yeah. got to do all the hiring, and then sort of, uh, and then they, when, when people uh, when people leave, right? When people aren't hitting their numbers, it doesn't create a great environment. Okay, and so I mean, what, what's the average tenure for a VP of sales, Steve? Mm, two years. Two years, all right. Yeah. So about two years on the high side. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, so it's about 18 months. Wow. A little bit that, over. Is that the average? That means there's a lot less than 18 months then. So half less are less than 18 eight. months, half or more. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's pretty horrendous. I mean, tough gig. I mean, the only person who gets it tougher is the CMO, uh, apparently. Okay. Who's, Yes, no, that's even less. But look, when you think about when you think about this, I mean, the rid and we're all sort of all these VPs are coming in with a similar playbook. They're coming, in, hey, I've got a mandate. I've, we've got to grow the business. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and hire some people. Okay, we're going to hire people. I'm going to give them tools. I'm going to go out, spend some money, enable them with leads, and then we're going to sort of build an organisation around them and train them on product, sales, and sales tricks. Right, this is a really, really common thing of what we see where people. Uh, are just going through the very same thing. But what happens when it goes wrong? Okay, so Steve, you talked about it. When they miss their number, what's the yep. first thing that, when the, they've got a whole bunch of people that miss their number, what's the first thing that VP of sales is gonna do? Well, they, they're often blaming the salespeople, right? They're gonna- Right, what do they mean? What, what do they do to them? That, that, that's step one in the playbook, is yeah, fire a few salespeople <laughs> and go through the cycle again and yeah, it keeps you safe, right? Uh, if yeah. you sit there, if you're seeing, if you're making, if you're doing action, yeah, I've got uh, an action plan. Yep, it keeps we, you in be the seat on the, for the a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And everyone understands that. It's a really simple and easy way to go about that. I mean, so what we typically find, like, right? there's another couple of tools that they put in their sales plan. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is they go buy some more technology. Oh okay, yeah, I'll, I'm going to buy some. Yeah, I'll put the reason why is because we're not able to make enough connections. Mm. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, we're going to give them some sales automation technology and we're going to be able to accelerate what they do. And so, yes. a lot of, and so if they weren't doing it properly in the first time, they're probably not going to be able to do it when you give them a tool to be able to do it at scale. And so they're probably going to start accelerating failure. Uh, and so that's typically sort of one of the things that we see, uh, see when it fails. So that's the, these are the two strategies we, we mm. often see people trying to do to be able to, to, be able to solve that. Yeah. So I, I'd like to get into some of the solutions and how we get to 80-80 in, in a minute. Like, are there any other sort of fundamental changes that, that, that have happened that, uh, that we need to consider? Or, or is there one or two key ones that we should, we should cover here? Oh, look, the one, the, the, the one other one I'd like to touch on, uh, and I think is sort of helpful, is, is when, you think about, when you think about how people buy uh, today and where the value sort of really comes for us in the business and the subscription revenue. The, 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 the revenue that 90, uh, in most SaaS products, it's sort of 70 to 75 to 95% of the revenue comes after, the, uh, after we sort of, uh, we, we, we first win the deal. So it happens. Oh yeah, early. of course. Yes. You know, so so typically that time when we first sign the on the dotted line is the yep. time that we've lost the most amount of money we ever will with the customer. Mm. You know, we've got to earn it back. Yeah, because it's a, a, a small upfront and just like monthly or quarterly payments, right? It's not exactly. not not the big bang. So most of the revenue is coming, you know, over the next two or three years. Absolutely. And so, Steve, yep. what's what are the ABCs of selling? <laughs> well, the old ones always be closing, right? But there, there's some more. Always be closing, ones. right? <laughs> always be yeah, communicating. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. And then there's new ones, curious. But isn't it? the amount of times I still see people walking around with kind of like sort of yeah, coffee I cups saying copies for closes and yeah, right. all this kind of I mean, it's, it, it's just that, that horrible action. Right? If we close the relationships with our customers at that point of sale, that mm. means that we're, we're actually, we're, we're forgetting about the whole bunch of revenue that needs to happen there. Sure. And so, but when we think about, uh, when we think about sort of all the sales methodologies that we've got out there, I mean, the sort of solution selling, value selling, consultative selling, mm. I mean, challenger and provocative selling, 
all these, all these different tools, they've all got one aim in mind. And that one aim is to go and close the customer. Go and get a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Create a deal, a deal. Get a deal. Yeah. But it's not about, hey, look, what actually, how are, you, how are we starting the relationship with our customers with the end goal in mind, which happens well and truly after that point of traditional yes. close. Mm. So we've got to start thinking about how we start to utilise these methodologies to be able to actually start thinking about, uh, think, well, think about are these methodologies going to be the right tools to enable us to be able to mm. go through and realise all that value and all that effort we put into this customer. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. So, so what, what would we do differently than using those methods, using a challenger or a disruptive strategy? Yeah. What, well, what is the philosophy? Is it sort of leading with, I don't, I'm not sure how you would lead otherwise. <laughs> You've got me really curious. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Like, and the big thing is it's uh, a lot of, you've got to think about, uh, we've got to start thinking about where, the, how we actually generate the money. Okay. Mm. And so the, 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 the think about the bottom line, the money comes from, uh, from when we actually get that signature. So we enable them, we're selling them on that future value. Yep. What we've got to do is just slightly change. Like we slightly change. We've got to help them to actually realise that we're going to be the person. Right? We're going to be we as the representative of the company, mm. and then as the company have to be that person that enables them to see that revenue. They've got to fall in love with the impact yes. that we're going to be able to provide them, and the way that we're going to deliver it for them. And then the money happens later. Yes. So okay. It's very much more customer centric mm. piece. I mean, there's a lot of. There's a lot of fantastic things in all those elements, like uh, in solution selling, in, in the consultative selling, I mean, sort of the guys at Neil Rackham and Spin, they've done amazing things. And there's so many tools yep. that we've got there to be able to leverage. Uh, we need to utilise, like, and the sort of the, the challenge or provocative sale. We've got to utilise all those. Yep. We've got to align them to the right stage of the process and, mm. do it and, and start being sort of treat the customer as the one, like, and just sort of bear in mind, we're the ones taking all the risk. Okay? Sure. Like this is the this is a big shift. We're the ones taking the risk. Yep. They're the ones. They 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 they're sort of working in a risk free environment. So we and they've they've got all the information in the world. So we've got to actually start changing the way that we yeah. sell. So it's actually an easier business. sell. You almost you're sort of saying you don't really need these high powered super salesmen salespeople. Because it's well, an easy sell. It's a yeah, lot. Yeah, I mean one of the three. Well, it's a, it's a, I, I, I like to think it's more, it's an honest sell. Right? Yeah. It's easier. Like, I mean, it's never easy. In sales, it's never an easy thing to be able to sort of go out and have this sort of great customer conversations with them. But yeah. there's no hiding. I mean, yeah. But we, we can't have that. There's no slick hair. No, there's a lot of, of accountability. Sales isn't it? Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Which is just built into the model, which sort of really helps people buy. Yes. Um, so, but sometimes we, we need to educate, educate them. And look, especially in the world of technology, there's a lot of innovative solutions out there. So yes. we really need to go and educate people how to buy, um, yep. which is a big change. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that that's a good topic as well. Educating customers how to buy. Um, okay. So let's get to the 8080 because it almost sounds like uh, we're going against the laws of nature. Everything sort of seems to go towards 8020. So, so how do we get to to eighty eighty and and get eighty percent of our team all producing at a sort of a steady level? Like it would be just beautiful if we have a a sales machine like that. Um, what does that look like? Wouldn't it? How goes <laughs> Nevada? Be, no, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> uh, we don't even have to come in. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, obviously, it's it's always the toughest thing. Okay, how do we how do we actually go and sort of make it repeatable? Uh, and and look, the big things of what we need to do is start thinking about like the, the model that I talked about before. Okay, where the VP of sales hires the people, then uh, fires the people, hires them, gives trains them yeah. up, and then fires them when they fail. Okay, we've got to start thinking of it. that that's a people oriented okay culture. What we've got to do is start flipping it towards a science based culture. Mm. And so when we look at 
go through and, and look at uh, look at all these different industries who sit there and take a scientific approach. If we look across engineering, if we look across into medicine, and then even to other organisations like sort of military or even into the arts. When something goes wrong, they don't immediately treat it as a people problem. The first element they do is they think about it as a process problem. Mm. You know, so uh, uh, we need to actually sort of flipping our lens from looking at it from, from being people centric to being process centric. Right. And it's only then, like, only then that we can actually start to sort of uncover where the real opportunities and problems lie. Yes. So, Steve, like another one for you. Like, you know, when, when, if you say if you say your win rate, a win rate is really really low. Uh, for, for sort of yep. a particular couple of, uh, for, for either a business or a particular couple of salespeople. How do you, how do you sort of diagnose what's going on? Well, it could be, you don't want to jump to conclusions on that. Um, you know, we could be going after the wrong type of customer, you know, starting right, right at the top. Um, we could be loading in uh, poor quality opportunities you know, into our pipeline. Um, we might not be competitive. Our product might not be competitive. Uh, the salespeople may not have the skills to help the customer, you know, uh, build the business case and solve their problem. Um, yeah, it could, could be a number of things that it needs uh, some study. So how do, how do you, how do you study? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's a good point. And I guess, you know, we've got to be looking at data as much as we can. And, uh, you know, we should well, know our business. You know, we should have some sense of our We should business. know our business. Yes. So this is, and, and you're absolutely spot there'll on. There'll be a lot okay, of in terms of, so there's we've got, what, Yeah, generally there'll be a lot of opinions. The marketing team will have a view on it. The CEO will have a view. I'll have a view as the sales manager. The reps will say it's the company's fault. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's probably a lot of absolutely uh, a lot of opinion hey, and finger pointing. <laughs> it's marketing's fault. Yeah, exactly. So and that's it's spot on. But the only way, okay, the only way we can find out what's happening yep. is to go. Uh, and this is sort of yep. a term followed from sort of lean manufacturing. You're like get back to the gemma. Yep. Okay, actually go and listen to the phone calls, read mm. the emails. Like it's only when we can go back and inspect the process by actually how they're doing it. Uh, it is the only way we can take away all that sort of cognitive bias that, mm. that, that, that people put in. Uh, people's uh, people's behaviour very, very rarely uh, aligns with their intentions. Okay, It's like when you go, when you sit there, you start the year and you go, fantastic, hey, new year, I'm going to go, mm -hmm. I'm going to lose a couple of pounds, I'm going to train three times a week. Yep. Okay, and then you sort of come out by the end of January, you're probably down to one time a week and uh, in February, you're, no, you're probably yep. sort of not doing things. This is people, and that's exactly the same that happens in sales. So mm -hmm. marketing might go to sales, oh, sales, how are you going with these discovery calls? How is that? Sales team going, yeah, that's great. I'm asking them all these questions, but they're not actually providing a response. Mm. Okay, they're, they think that they're, but are they actually doing it? Are they yeah. having these questions in a customer-centric way? So we actually need to go through and fit, inspect the process. Okay? We utilise the data to be able to tell us where to go, like where do we need to look, yep. what's important, but yeah, we need to, we need to go back to uh, listening to calls, mm. okay? going out with ride-alongs with our reps, reading emails to be able to ensure that they're, they're, uh, what's happening matches up. Yes. And so once we actually... Once we understand that, okay, once we go through, we can then look to fix the process. Mm. Okay, what is it that we need to do? How do we need to enable them? Do we need to give them, do we need to give them more, uh, more knowledge? Okay, yes. You know, more knowledge on sort of the, the, the products, the, the, products the, the, the knowledge on sort of how the customer or the industry. And yes. Then do we need to give them skills to turn that knowledge into weapon? Uh, so do we need to enable them there? And do they, is more technology going to support that? So, when we look at it process first, when we go back to the Gemma, we can actually un unlock where, yep. those, uh, where those opportunities for growth are. So, so is this something that's enabled by technology? Is this like a, a more recent thing that we're now able to inspect a lot more scientifically than, than before? Or, 
Yeah, I mean, look, there, there, there obviously is a lot of technology out there that enables yep. people to be able to do this on calls uh, that you've got uh, in terms of like there's Gong, there's Chorus, there's Refract, yep. there's uh, Exec Vision, all these sort of call, uh, which are AI powered call, uh, call, call analysis new technology. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Call analysis, yeah. So you've got this, the, I mean, that's great, but the reality is people have been able to do this all the time. Right? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of industries where people they, they'd find a way. They double jack in on the phone call. Absolutely, and listen to it live. Well, we've well, so been hearing it. Yeah, well, I grew up in Dell. I had 13 years in Dell, and we inspected everything, and we had the process like nailed down. You know, from you know, inbound, outbound, talk time, number of call. You know, listening to calls. We had coaches on the floor. Um, all that stuff. So I'm sort of quite familiar, but yeah, you know, that that's sort of unusual to see that these days, you know, um, possibly even in there, right? <laughs> a lot of it's been stripped away. Yeah, why? Why do you think? Why do you think? Why do you think that sort of stopped happening? I'm not sure. It just seems over years through you know, different cost cutting and you know, for some reason that wasn't justified as a as, as an expense, um, and it just seemed to to suffer, you know, as different cuts came in companies and things got scored. Yeah, you know, people miss quotas. They they get rid of that function. They'd rather keep their core sales team rather than you know, let the support functions go. Um, yeah, it comes from like, and look, the main reason is it's hard. Right? It's not easy to be able to go through and do this. Like it takes effort. Yes. Uh, but and, and the reality is that, that that people are very much focused on on the sort of performance. They are. Oh, sorry, for, for, sorry, focused on results over the performance. Yeah. So they they really was looking at lagging. I just want to I just want to go out and invest in lagging. I know. Metrics. And and sales and leaders. Like, I, my experience now is sales leaders are so busy. They're so busy with. They're responsible for so many metrics, so many initiatives. They're busy hiring. They're busy firing. <laughs> they're in forecast calls. They're not inspecting this stuff that much, actually. Like I know I partner with some sales leaders and I'm doing inspection sort of on their behalf, helping them, then reporting to them what's going yeah. on because they can't get at it these days. It's quite, um, that's something else that's going on for sure. Absolutely. Like, and, and this yeah. is sort of where we see this as being, uh, this is being I mean, a huge failure in, in, how we're, in how we're trying to enable our sales teams. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're, the, we're sort of following the very traditional model that, hey, look, the, the, the sales leader, the sales manager is the bastion of all that's, all knowledge uh, and all that is good. So yes. they're the ones who have to go and, and, and tick tack. Like, and and, yes. and I've, got to find, I've got to find the time to be able to share, like uh, set up a presentation to be able to, to the sales team on, on how to do this and how to do that. Mm. But, but when we look to learn science, what we actually find is that that's not how people learn. I mean, that's only 10% of how people learn. Mm. Okay? Yes. So the, the, and so that's what they're providing. Then sort of they've got to be able to create opportunities to be able to learn amongst their peers which is the other 20%. And then the 70% is actual purposeful practice. And so when we sort of look at that 10, 20, 70 principle, we've got to think about what role does the sales leader take? Mm. The reality is they, they're only probably taking that 10%. Other than that, they've got to enable that other 90% of learning has to happen Absolutely. In a, amongst their peers. Like it's got to be this, you've got to create this coaching culture within the business that, uh, that, that enables your teams to be able to go and learn. Sure. Yeah, and, and like you say, you, you first have to design your process. You need to be measuring your process. Then you need to be living it. Then you've got to be involved in it end-to-end -end, uh, to, to make it stick. Yeah. So, Andy, we, we've covered a, a lot Absolutely. of ground there. We've covered a lot of ground. We've we covered um, you know, some of the changes that are affecting us, uh, specifically the tech industry with that shift from the big bang sale uh, towards these sort of... Uh, a lot of higher volume, smaller value, ongoing value sort of sales and, you know, moving from the 80-20 to the 80-80 and uh, some of the things you've got to do to, to make that happen. 
Uh, anything else on your mind before we, we, we finish up on, the, on this topic? Uh, oh, look, I, I've, he, that summary there, I mean, talked about some of the, sort of the, the big elements, but it's all yep. about, uh, for us, the only thing we sit there and talk about is the fact that you've got to actually, to be able to have a process to be able to inspect it, you've got to create it, okay? Uh, and, and it needs to sort of be focused not on, not on actually going through and, and forecast, better forecasting your business, but actually okay. enabling your sales team to succeed. So uh, just think about it from A, your customer's perspective, B, start thinking about what, how do we actually enable our reps to succeed? And yep. from there, you're going, to start, you're going to start putting yourself in a much better position to be able to tackle some of these big challenges in B2B sales. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. And um, I, I think that really works where you're working with the sales team in a very context-specific way. You know, you're saying, okay, here are our customers here are the profiles we go after, here's our value prop for them, and then build your sales process and your training and enablement all around that, and then uh, you know, embed that and live that. So um, yeah, instead of the, the hit and run. Absolutely. <laughs> or relying on your naturally great yeah, The sales. one thing I'd like to add. Yeah. Well, Bill, you, you've got to take sales out of that black box. Okay, which is that fast talking salesperson who just goes, hey, look, I got this. It's all right. I'll go out and do it. And then you wonder why where the results are nine months later. Yes. Okay, what we've got to do is treat sales more like a science. You know, so you put some little, te yep. create tests to be able to validate that. When we're going into targeting a new market, let's not treat it like a game of chess thinking nine moves ahead. Let's mm -hmm. treat it like a game of angry birds. Okay, like uh, it's just sort of ready, fire, aim again. Ready, yes. fire, aim again. Like we using the data to give us yeah, the keep iterating, keep improving. That we're on the yeah. 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 Exactly. No, I, I like that. And um yeah, we know almost every other function in the business is very scientific. When you look at manufacturing, operations, even marketing now, very data driven, very scientific. Uh sales is sort of the last uh bastion and uh we'll be better for it. Yeah. All right, Andy. Well, I think that, 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 was, that was excellent. So really thank you uh, for coming on the show. I think the listeners would have got a lot out of that and um, look forward to uh, meeting up with you again. So thanks a lot. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. And, and look, for those of you who are interested in sort of learning more, we've obviously uh, come and check out our YouTube channel where we've got great videos where we talk about some of these things and give you some tips on how to actually go through and, and implement a little bit more of a, coach, a scientific approach and a coaching culture. Yeah, so we'll, we'll put uh, all the details in the, uh, the show notes. And uh, yeah, I, can, uh, I absolutely agree with that. I've been uh, looking at a lot of your content in the last few days and uh, some really fantastic stuff there. So, and the books are great too. Um, all those, those books on the sales blueprint and everything. So recommend to everyone to check that out. Um, so thanks everyone for listening and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye for now.